I try to just remind myself that I've been in that place before and climbed back out of it and that nothing is really like a permanent state, especially in this industry. Welcome to Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, the weekly podcast that asks published authors to share their successful query letter and discuss their journey from first spark to date of publication. I am your host, author Sarah Nicholas, and literary agent Sarah Fisk. Kiri McCauley is the author of If These Wings Could Fly and We Can Be Heroes. She lives near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with her family, three rescue cats, and a dog that eats books and is never sorry. So please welcome Kiri to the show. Hello. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with everyone. We're going to talk about your journey to publication today, and we're going to start at the beginning. When did you first start getting interested in writing, and how long did it take from then before you started getting serious about pursuing publication? I started getting serious about writing um, in my early 20s. It's something that had been there uh, most of my life, but I didn't pursue it. And in my early 20s, I decided to sit down and write a novel for fun. Uh, It was something I always wondered, could I do it? Could I finish a book? And for about four years, the answer was no, I couldn't finish writing one. It was a lot of trial and error. And then I finally finished my first full complete novel and shelved it and then wrote another one. And that was the one that I actually decided to pursue querying for the first time. So probably about five years of writing without querying before I actually started sending out those letters. Can you tell me a little bit more about the moment that you realized that you wanted to be a published author? That was definitely the thing that was there my whole life. Books were like my best friend as a kid. And uh, I remember my mom used to take us to like a Dollar General for a treat. We didn't have a lot of money, but she'd let us go in and pick out like one thing. And my siblings would get little toys from the toy aisle. And every single time I came out with like a composition notebook. And so even from a really young age, it was like that blank page really called me. And I knew that I wanted to create and do something along those lines. But at that point, I think that I was holding writing and authors and the idea of a published book in such high esteem that I couldn't even consider pursuing it seriously. It felt so far out of the realm of something that I could do. Um, So I pursued everything else. I considered a million other careers and I studied something else in college. And it wasn't until my senior year of college that I sat down to try writing a novel. And it wasn't until my mid 20s that I started taking myself seriously. And even then, I think it probably wasn't until the day my book actually published that I was like, oh, this is a real thing that's happening. (laughs) Every step along the way, I was like, this is it. This is where they're going to call it. This isn't a real thing that I get to do. (laughs) So I felt really lucky at every stage. And it still feels really surreal to me. So once you decided that you wanted to be a published author, how did you go about learning more about the publishing industry, especially how to query, how to go about submitting, that kind of thing? I was really lucky to have a group of writing friends early on. I was connected via another person that I met back in high school. We actually did a political camp together, Jenny Paranovic and I. We had to write a brief for senators and argue for funding for something that we were both really passionate about. And we wrote about like why libraries should be better funded. So we had like this immediate connection over books and libraries and stories. And I reconnected with her in our 20s. And she was running a writing group called The Great Noveling Adventure. And that was how I learned about NaNoWriMo. That was my first real attempt to sit down and write a whole novel. So I was lucky to find a writing group really early on and be able to share with them the writing as we went, the querying process as we went. We were learning from each other and, you know, cheering on each other's successes. So it was really, really beneficial. Nice. So then what happened? Can you break down for us your journey from then to signing your first book contract? I wrote several novels that didn't go anywhere. I'm glad they did and I'm glad I'm glad I didn't continue pursuing them. I knew that I needed to figure out what kind of stories I wanted to write and that I hadn't quite figured that out yet. I was writing anything that I loved to read. So I was trying romance and I was trying fantasy and I was trying science fiction. And finally, I settled on this idea. It was something that had, it had appealed to me for a long time to write about the topic of domestic violence because of a survivor, but I couldn't quite crack like how to approach that story in a way that was 
wholly honest and sensitive to what the topic entails without, you know, getting too close to my own trauma. So that took me some um, maneuvering and but I finally, I finally just decided to dive in and give it a chance. I figured out a way to incorporate magic to the story. And those magical elements kind of served as like a shield. And then the story just like flowed out. So it took me six weeks to draft the first draft of what became my debut novel. Uh, and then a really long time of revising it. So it was a really fast first draft of If These Wings Could Fly, and I knew it needed a lot of work. So I entered it into Pitch Wars in 2017, and I got in. Um, my mentors were Mindy McGinnis and Kate Carius Quinn. I remember when I first got the edit letter from them, I just like sobbed because I was like, why did they <laughs> even pick me? <laughs> what did they even like about it? There's so much I need to change. But I kind of like embraced the work and the book was so much better for it. And Pitch Wars led me to my agent. All right. And then you signed with your agent. Uh, Susie Townsend in um, November. So really right after the Pitch Wars showcase. So she received my materials through a request in the Pitch Wars showcase. And I think by the end of that same month, I had signed with her. Oh, right. That's before we moved it. The showcase yes. that was in November, yeah. right? Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think that was the last, I think we were the last November showcase and it moved the following year. Yeah, so then I, I signed with Susie in November and If These Wings Could Fly sold in March. It went to auction in mid-March and it sold a two-book deal at that time to Catherine Teigen Books at HarperCollins. Awesome. Can you read your successful query letter for us? Thank you for requesting If These Wings Could Fly in the 2017 Pitch Wars Showcase. 17-year-old Leighton Barnes has her choice of heartbreaks, leave her sisters in a violent home, or sacrifice her college dreams. Leighton's father is dangerous, so she knows that home doesn't always mean safe. But every time he threatens them and breaks things, her house inexplicably heals itself, and her mom inexplicably forgives him. Acceptance to her dream college is finally within reach, but Leighton can't imagine abandoning her sisters. Suddenly, the chaos isn't contained to home. Leighton's town is flooded by tens of thousands of crows, and she wonders if they've all been dropped into a Hitchcock classic. Experts can't explain the bird's presence, but Leighton has her own theory. Like her house that fixes itself, she believes the birds are somehow there to protect her and her sisters. Leighton persists balancing school and survival under the shadow of 60,000 feathered wings. Fellow senior Liam makes no secret of the fact that he likes her. With her home life crumbling and the town going mad, Leighton is hesitant to give Liam a chance, but there's a rebellion taking shape inside of her, and Leighton is ready to take flight. She'll start by exposing her heart to a risk she's learned to avoid all too well. When you come from a violent home, falling in love is a revolutionary act. If These Wings Could Fly is a young adult contemporary with magical elements complete at 64,000 words. Nice. Thank you so much for sharing that. Of course. Did your Pitch Wars mentors help you with the query as well? They did. And I actually did a query critique with Catherine Locke before Pitch Wars. So yeah, that was actually, it was my my husband's birthday present to me that year was mm. getting a query critique. And that was enormously helpful. Also just for my confidence going into Pitch Wars. Mm -hmm. That was my first major workshop of my query letter. And then again, for the Pitch Wars showcase, we went through it. So how has your experience been since sending your contract, especially were there any surprises along the way? So many surprises. I thought that I knew a lot about publishing when I accepted the contract. I thought that I had learned so much in the years that I had spent querying and writing. And then I think it sort of became clear to me just a few months in that writing a book and publishing a book almost felt like two entirely different skill sets. So <laughs> there was all of the work that I'd put into developing as a writer, figuring out what kind of stories I wanted to create, and then, you know, improving the skills to actually write those stories. Uh, and all of a sudden, on the flip end, realizing that I didn't really know how to promote myself or my books or engage in that way, that part of it was really intimidating for me. I'm such a deep introvert. So like the quiet, tucked away at home, working on my projects was always really appealing to me about writing. And then the other side of like the idea of my writing being out in the world, putting myself out there talking about this topic that was really sensitive to me on all of these public formats, that part was really intimidating. So it was a surprise to me to realize how 
hard that part would be as excited as I was about it. I had a huge learning curve about publishing itself. It is time for the quick round. I call it author DNA. Okay. Are you a pantser or a plotter? Both. (laughs) Somewhere in between. (laughs) Okay. As a true pantser, anytime anyone says both, I'm like, you're a plotter then. Because oh. <laughs> like if you plan anything to me, you're a plotter. But <laughs> Oh, that's funny. I was such a pantser forever. Um, and I just kept writing myself into terrible messes. So yeah, yeah now I plan a little. <laughs> Do you tend to be an overwriter or an underwriter? I'm definitely an underwriter. I like to build like the skeleton first and then go back and add to it later. Do you prefer to write in the morning or at night? At night would be my preference, but I have small children. So usually I have to wake up for them to get my writing in. Mm. When it comes to writing a first draft, do you typically start with character or plot or concept or something else first? Concept. I think most of my stories start with like a single image or a bit of dialogue. It's just like this flash of an idea. And I play with that story until I can see if it has anything more to it. Do you prefer coffee or tea? coffee. Whenever you're writing, do you prefer silence or some kind of sound? Sound, uh, but only white noise. I can't really listen to music or I just start singing along. So when it comes to the first draft, are you more of a get it down kind of person or get it right? Get it down. What tools or software do you use to draft? I like to draft in Scrivener and honestly on the notes app on my phone. If I'm, (laughs) if I'm running around, that's usually where I tend to pull up and get ideas down in the moment. Do you prefer drafting or revising more? Revising. Do you write in sequential order or do you hop around? I hop around. I like to chase whatever scene is coming to me as it comes. Wow. I think you're actually the first person who's like truly a hop arounder. (laughs) Oh, really? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's why I need Scrivener so I can jump from beginning to end. Yeah. You already answered this, but for the record, are you an extrovert or an introvert? Very much an introvert. (laughs) So the show is called Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, and we're going to talk about that second cue now. What were some of the worries that you had on your journey, and were they realized, or did you overcome them, or how did they shake out? A big part of my nervousness was the topic I was writing about and how that would be received. It was really sensitive to me, and it was really personal to write about domestic violence, and then I also felt like very much the weight of writing about that topic and wanting to get it right for readers who had experienced it and also for readers who hadn't experienced it. And this might be their only insight into a home that is violent. My book was about familial domestic violence. So it's a little different than like relationship violence, which I think has been explored in young adult books before. But it was just, I I was very nervous about staying true to the depictions of that issue and making sure that they were accurate and knowing that an accurate of portrayal of domestic violence like isn't going to sit very well with everybody because it was the mom staying and mm-hmm. what was driving her staying and these big questions about the dynamics of that kind of interaction, that kind of uh, relationship that people have. So I was nervous about the topic. I was nervous about putting an entire book out there that reflected some of my own experiences growing up and knowing that it would be talked about and dissected and that it would be, you know, potentially this really important source of information for young readers. So I was so scared of that. And not to say that I shouldn't have been, because I think that that fear and that nervousness made me take it as seriously as I needed to, to write about it. But the feedback that I've gotten, especially from young readers, has been really incredible. Um, I get a lot of messages from other survivors, and it's just kind of incredible to hear directly from them and know that the story is reflecting what they saw as well. Yeah, I cannot imagine how big of a weight that was while you're writing and querying that book. Now we're going to talk about the third cue. Do you have any writing quirks? Is there anything about your writing process that you think is kind of different or interesting or unique? I really, I am like the opposite of one for a writing routine. So I don't have a space. I mean, I have an office, but I write on the go. And like I said, I have really little kids. So a ton of my writing has taken place like actually at playgrounds. Most of the time while I'm drafting, and this has been 
different, of course, during the pandemic. But before, my favorite places to write were like the Children's Museum and the zoo. Mm -hmm. And my partner would go off with the kids and I would sit and be around like all of this hustle and bustle and noise and like kids laughing and playing. And for some reason, that was like the perfect white noise and like knowing that like my family was totally content and I could be hands off and just focus on my writing. That was like my favorite place in the world <laughs> to do my work. I miss that a lot. So even now I need like some kind of ambient noise sound on when I'm working. But yeah, I think if I had my pick, it would be like a children's museum or the zoo every single day to sit and, and write. You have that like mom superpower of being able to tune out like the children screaming. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it was so necessary. But when I was drafting Wings, um, my youngest was seven and eight months old while I was writing it. And it was like, we had a four year old, it was like that chaos of like tiny baby days. And the only time that I had to really just like sit and not be interrupted or doing something else was always like actually nursing my child. So that was <laughs> how I drafted my first book. And I think it kind of, I just like would pop up a pillow in front of his little head and like be typing away. <laughs> so I think it sort of set the tone for how I would keep working and keep writing books was to be able to do it while like balancing a few other things. And it's good for my brain to work that way. And have a few other things going on at the same time that I can turn to and take a break if I need to. Mm. When you were in the lowest parts of your journey, what kept you going and why did you stick to it? I feel like I still return to those pretty frequently. Mm -hmm. I thought that those feelings would go away post publication or <laughs> there'd be like some special milestone or, you know, successful thing that I had done or achieved or some goal that I had on a piece of paper in my journal a few years ago. I'd be like, oh, okay, like I did it, I'm doing this. But I don't know, it's just a little different with writing. I feel like there are a lot of like mountains and valleys and my writing kind of has those moments too of like extreme inspiration and I get this whole idea down in a couple of weeks or I've got nothing and I can't write for months. So for me, it's a lot of like stop and go and feeling really confident about it and then feeling like once again, I'm like back at square one and have no idea what I'm doing and feel like I don't understand publishing at all. So I, I try to just remind myself that I've been in that place before and climbed back out of it and that nothing is really like a permanent state, especially in this industry. So I, I like that way of thinking. It keeps me really like grounded and I stay really grateful for the things that I have had success in. And then at the same time, I don't feel like quite so let down when I have those harder moments. And I just, I don't think that I'll ever be rid of them. I think that there's always going to be like that thing I didn't get or, you know, the, the starred review or the blurb or whatever it is, whatever it is I'm chasing at that moment, every one of those defeats still feels pretty crushing. So I think it's just a difficult industry because you're always going to have some kind of rejection going on at every level and just figuring out how to, you know, live with that and be comfortable with that and then be able to look forward to the next, the next peak that you get to climb to. Hmm. Did you make any mistakes along the way to publication that you might want to warn listeners about so they can hopefully avoid making the same mistakes? Yeah, so many, probably. But <laughs> a big one for me is I'm, I am like a, a very anxious person. I've struggled with anxiety my whole life. And I, I let it shape a lot of my experience as a debut author, and got so caught up in the nerves and the worry at every stage that I don't think I had a lot of moments where I was just like, hey, you're doing the thing, like, be excited, you're doing the thing and the book is coming out. And this is an incredible thing. So I, I would definitely advise, like, try to enjoy those steps right in the moment. And again, this is an industry where you're always looking ahead. And while Wings was releasing, I was on deadline for my second book. So and that experience kind of keeps repeating itself, you always have the next project or the next thing. And it can make it really hard to be present and appreciate what's going on right in that moment. And, you know, <laughs> have that have that feeling of like, hey, no, I'm, I had this goal and now I've made it to this goal and, you know, taking a breather to appreciate getting there. So I think that, that that was always really hard for me. I missed out on a lot of the joys of the experience because I was so caught up in 
a fear of failure and a fear of like not doing the next thing that I needed to do that that sort of detracted from it or it distracted from it so much that I never had like I was never fully present in those moments that should have felt really great. Can you share with listeners one of the most important lessons that you learned on your journey into publication? Like I said before, I think being really present and appreciating, you know, the stage that you're at right now. And I know that while I was drafting my books, I thought like there can be nothing worse than querying and facing these rejections. And um, I'm a Pitch Wars mentor this year. It's my first year mentoring. And I was just reflecting a little bit more about how hard that stage of writing was for me. I think that I queried and shelved one book for like, I think I queried it for a year. I had something like 120 rejections on it. And I was, I was sure, I was sure it was the book and it wasn't the book. Yeah. So I, I've been thinking about that querying process and how difficult those rejections were and could be. And I also, uh, I think that part of me now that I'm like on the other side misses that. And I know that after my books have come out, I've had this really weird instinct where I like think of something that I wish I could write into them now and a scene that would be perfect for my characters or something that I'm just like, oh gosh, I want to like go back in and revise this part. And, you know, there's something just so permanent about publishing, like that story is done and I don't get to go back to it and revisit it. And I don't get to go live with those characters in that world anymore. And it does make me miss it. So I kind of wish I'd appreciated like that side of things and where I was just like, creating in that world and falling in love with the act of writing and finding my own voice in writing. It's a long process and it can be really heartbreaking sometimes to face rejection after rejection, but it's also like this incredible period of time where you are creating without a deadline and without expectations and without the pressures that come with publishing. And while so many of those are like enormous privileges that I'm super grateful to have now part of me really misses that side of writing where it was just for it was just for the love of it and there was like no guarantee no reason to believe that I would find an agent or a publisher or sell a book Um, I was just doing it because because I loved it and I still love it but it's just like with a whole different set of responsibilities and expectations and pressures and if you're an anxious little bean like me those things build up to be big things so mm-hmm. appreciating and being present in whatever stage of writing you're at I think can be really important yeah for sure to one of your points so you reminded me the story I heard years ago about this kind of eccentric writer who would get really upset about one of her books, like she wanted to change something in it, one of her published books, and she would go into her local bookstore and start like writing in the copies oh there gosh. to change them. So yeah, I think that's something oh, that's people have so struggled funny. with for a long time. <laughs> it's funny because it was just like, it was just like this knee jerk reaction at first where I was like, oh my gosh, like Liam should do this. And then I was like, wait, no, that's, that book's done. It's like really done. <laughs> it's sitting on my bookshelf done. So the instinct to keep revising my books never went away. It's still just like right there at the surface. <laughs> You're like writing fan fiction of your own book so you can write the In ideas that you had later. All, <laughs> all right. I call this the acknowledgements portion of the podcast. This is not a business that most of us succeed in completely on our own. Who are some of the people or even organizations who helped you along the way and how? Well, this one's easy for me because Pitch Wars shaped a lot of my experience in publishing. I had two fantastic mentors, Mindy McGinnis and Kate Carries Quinn, and they were so open and available the entire time of Pitch Wars and incredibly insightful. And just, I, I knew nothing going in. So I asked them a million questions and they were really open to those questions. I'm so grateful for that. I'm really excited to do that for my own mentee now. So definitely Pitch Wars. I I still am in the Facebook group with my fellow mentees from 2017. I love that group and the friendships that we have. And it's been really, I don't know, special to stay with the same group of friends going through similar things through this entire course of things. And I have a couple of friends from our debut group as well, which is a special kind of bond because we all debuted in the pandemic together. So it was this this panic followed by (laughs) this incredible showing up of community and support. And I'm really, really 
um, grateful for those those friendships because we've been navigating this thing that nobody knows how to navigate in publishing and sort of figuring it out as debut authors, which was incredibly intimidating. But we've been able to create some really special bonds and friendships out of that and have a lot of plans for the future to continue working with each other and collaborating with each other. So I think that's exciting. And then my best friend in publishing is Jenny Paranovic still. We've known each other since we were 16 is when we went to that camp together. So we've been friends for like 17 years now. Um, and she's just signed with an incredible agent and she's we're working on stories at the same time right now, as well as co-mentoring and pitch wars. So it's really nice to have a friend navigating the same big questions at the same time. Awesome. So we know all about If These Wings Could Fly from the query that you read for us, which, by the way, was the winner of the William C. Morris Debut Award. (laughs) So I want to mention that because I love to brag on people. But could you tell us about We Can Be Heroes? Absolutely. We Can Be Heroes follows three best friends in the aftermath of a tragedy. There is a incident of a shooting at their school, and it involves one of the three best friends and her ex-boyfriend. So this is a story that navigates um, dating violence and gun violence and um, the presence of gun violence in our schools. It's about the two friends that survived the incident, um, sort of navigating this incredible loss, and then their friend returns to them in the form of a ghost. And the three of them together form a vengeance plan, which is essentially an awareness plan about dating violence and gun violence and sort of pushing back against how unfair it was that Cassie actually lost her life due to the inactions and the egos of some of the people in their town. Okay, Kiri, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with everyone today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. You can find the text of Kiri's query in the show notes, along with links to find out more about her and her books. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you'd help me find new listeners by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser, telling your friends, or sharing this episode on social media. And if you're interested in supporting the show, you can go to patreon.com slash pubtalklive. If you're a published author interested in being a guest on the show, please click on the home base link in the description or go to sarahnicholas.com and click on the podcast logo in the sidebar. That's Sarah with an H and Nicholas with no H. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.